Hey everybody, in this episode we are going over the seven key ideas from Turn the Ship Around by retired Navy submarine captain David Marquet. I'm excited to share this summary because this book was very valuable to me in my career as a naval officer. It was something that I referred to and I think it's great for anyone who's working in an organization where you've got structure, you've got hierarchy, and you want to learn to take the people who were labeled as the followers and help them to become the leaders. That's what this book is all about, turning followers into leaders. The first idea that's going to help you with turning followers into leaders is to recognize that the old model is failing. The old model is what David described as the traditional model that we're taught in the Navy that he learned at the Naval Academy. It's basically control. You have your leaders and you have your followers, and the leaders are trying to control the followers. That model just doesn't work. That model is adopted from physical, manual labor, industrial era ideas that aren't relevant in today's knowledge economy and certainly aren't relevant for someone like David who was leading a team on a nuclear submarine. To do technical work like that that requires tremendous expertise and probably not so much physical labor, it just doesn't make sense to control people. What's much more effective is to have a leader-leader situation and to allow people to flourish and bring their own ideas to work. Key idea number two is that most empowerment programs don't really work. The idea that it takes the boss to empower you is actually disempowering. That's to say that you don't have anything unless the boss gives it to you, and it just creates more of a dynamic of dependency. David says that humans are born into a state of action. That's how we have to recognize people, that that is their heart, that is their nature. To be in action and to empower them or to tell them that they need you to be empowered is simply inaccurate. Key idea number three is that the leader-leader model is the solution. In organizations where you have leaders and other leaders, then the person who's in charge, yes, they still have responsibility. They still are the classic leader, but they are giving away the control of something to the people who are more equipped to do it. And they are pushing control down that chain of command to allow people who are the technical experts to be the ones in control of their place of expertise. And this makes great sense, especially in a submarine. For David, in his specific case, he actually showed up at the submarine being trained to lead a different submarine. He trained for months to one submarine, and then at the last minute, order changes, and he ends up at the Santa Fe. That's his submarine. And he's not technically trained to lead that submarine. If people had just blindly followed whatever he told them to do, it would have been extremely dangerous. It was much safer, much less risky for him to instead give control to the people who are technically trained to do it. And this is the first thing that we talked about when David and I did a video podcast interview. I'll put a link to that down in the description if you want to hear more of what David has to say about this topic. Key idea number four is to want not to be missed. This is a classic mistake that people make. They seem to associate everything with the leader. If the sub is good, or if the team is good, or if the organization is good, then we say, oh, well, it's because they had a strong leader. And then if things go poorly when that person leaves, the CEO leaves the company, and then things go down the tank, well, man, it must be because that CEO was so great and nobody else could pull it off. This is not what you want to set up. This makes a leader-centric sort of cult of the leader situation in your organization. And then it makes you naturally want to set up the person to follow you for failure. You want them to look bad so that you'll look good by comparison. Instead, you want to not be missed. You want the organization to run smoothly when you're not around. I heard Jack Dorsey, CEO of Twitter and Square, talk about this on Rich Roll's podcast, and he was explaining he wants Twitter and Square to run so that if he were hit by a bus tomorrow and couldn't do his job or died, that things would get on without him. That's what you want to do. And the only way to do that is to push control down to other people. Let other people lead. If you keep everything focused on yourself as the leader, if you make all decisions go through you, then when the time comes for you to leave, other people aren't trained to make the decisions. Instead, the better thing is to want not to be missed. Key idea number five is that followers make more followers. I used to work for a guy in the Navy who called everyone below his rank minions. So when he was a lieutenant commander in 04, he called all the lieutenants in below minions. Then one day he gets promoted to commander, 05, higher rank. Now all the lieutenant commanders are minions. 
It's not about the actual rank. It's about him and how he viewed the people who were beneath him in the hierarchy. This is an extremely dangerous way to look at people and to train people and to use the language that tells people that that's who they are, that they are just minions. That is not going to stimulate people to bring their best to work when you call them minions. It's going to make more followers. And I wonder, where did this guy learn that from? Probably someone else who treated him like that. If you perpetuate this idea that followers are just followers and don't have anything to bring to work, you will get that result. You will perpetuate that idea, and that will be the response that you get from your workers. Followers make more followers. Key idea number six is that a leader-leader model is risky. It's going to involve some risk. It's going to involve some change in your organization, I'm sure, to push control down to other people, to have other people serve as leaders within their particular section of the organization. That's going to mean that you're going to be a little more hands-off, that things could happen that maybe you could have prevented if you had been micromanaging everyone. That's going to feel like risk at first. However, this is the heart of of leadership. This is the heart of Jocko Willink's book too. If you know Navy SEALs, Jocko Willink and Leif Babin, they talk about this. It's extreme ownership. It's recognizing that you are responsible, but you can't do everything yourself. So you have to give control to others and at the same time, be responsible for setting them up the best that you can and be responsible for what they do. Be responsible for the people who you trained, who you picked, who you sent out to do the job. Recognize that that is your responsibility, but at the same time, you cannot micromanage those people. David describes this as simultaneously caring and not caring. You must care about your people. You must care about the mission. You must care about the organization. But at the same time, you must let go of some things. You must let go of your ego a bit. And you must let go of caring about how maybe someone's mistake is going to affect the bureaucratic processes around your career. Maybe someone makes an error and that ends up on paperwork that is reviewed next time you're up for a promotion. Letting go of simple, personal things like that, and instead focusing on the bigger picture of having people become leaders, developing the people around you, and developing your team to be more robust, is the much higher aim. And key idea number seven is to shift the focus from error to achievement. And this is hard. That that previous point, too, about, you know, letting people make mistakes potentially, it's extremely hard for naval officers in particular because we were trained not to make mistakes. We're trained to look for error. We have constant inspections where we're measured by our errors rather than by our excellence. But to have a great organization, you must focus on achievement. You must focus on excellence and you must give people a place where it's okay to make mistakes in the pursuit of excellence. That's the only way to get ahead. And it gets back to point number two, about the human desire for action and how that is necessary for human flourishing. In a knowledge economy in particular, if you want to stand out, if you want people to bring great ideas, if you want your organization to be innovative, on the cutting edge, to do things that's never been done before, you must instill this in people, that they are aiming for excellence and not for the avoidance of error. Those are the seven key ideas from Turn the Ship Around by Navy Submarine Captain Retired, David Marquet. If you want to see the whole interview that we did, I've got a link down in the description. You can check that out, and I'll catch you next time.